Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Schnellos, where medicine makes perfect sense. Today we have another pharmacology video. We'll talk about a drug used to treat inflammatory bowel disease such as ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. The name of the prince is Vidalizumab. If you want to learn about another drug called Benralizumab, which is used for asthma, check out my previous video. It's called Respiratory Pharmacology Bonus. First, please don't be fooled. IBD is not the same as IBS, not even close. IBD is inflammatory bowel disease, IBS is irritable bowel syndrome, these are not the same. Today we are focused on IBD. Now, IBD includes ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. It really breaks my heart. It tears down my left ventricle when students cannot tell the difference because it tells me that they cannot read. Okay, what's this, baby? Ulcerative colitis. Can you say it one more time? Colitis. Colitis? Colonitis. Inflammation of the colon. So, ulcerative colitis involves the colon and the colon only. But I disagree with this. No one cares. You're what's known as wrong. You're sweet, but you're wrong. However, Crohn's disease is a disease. Oh, that's tricky. It can involve your entire gastrointestinal tract from the tip of your mouth to the tip of your anus. But I need to add two notes. What is the most likely location to have Crohn's disease? The terminal ileum. What is the least likely place? The rectum. For some crazy reason, Crohn's disease spares the rectum. By the same token, for some crazy reason, polyarteritis nodosa spares the pulmonary arteries. And here is a $64,000 question. Does polyarteritis nodosa spare the bronchial arteries as well? I have no idea, but that's a great question. It's a question for you to use in order to flex your academic muscle on your woke professor. Treatment of rheumatoid arthritis was discussed before. Rheumatoid arthritis, medical and surgical. Medical include non-steroidals, steroidals are here with the immunosuppressants, and then we have the DMODs, the disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, such as synthetic and biological. The biological are divided into TNF and non-TNF. If you remember the synthetic DMARs, which are medical treatment for rheumatoid arthritis, one of them was the sulfasalazine. Sulfasalazine is used for rheumatoid it's also used for IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. Sulfasalazine was discussed before in my rheumatology playlist on YouTube, as well as on my antibiotics course on my website, medicosisperfectionalis.com. In a nutshell, here is sulfasalazine. It has two main components, the sulfa pyridine component and 5-aminosalicylic acid or 5-ASA component. Sulfapyridine is good for rheumatoid arthritis, 5-ASA is good for IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. And this is one option to treat inflammatory bowel disease. But there is another option. It's today's topic. It's called the Vidulizumab. Actually, it's a beautiful name once you understand it and break it down. Let's compare between neutrophils and platelets. Neutrophils, as you know, are responsible for acute inflammation. Platelets are responsible for primary hemostasis. The problem happens when the physiology professor explains hemostasis for you in year one, and then the woke pathology professor explains to you acute inflammation in year two, and you have no idea that they are related. Oh, by the way, if you need to learn more about other drugs that end in MAP, I have an anti-cancer pharmacology course on my website. Go to medicosisperfectionalis.com. But I don't understand medicosis. How are the neutrophils and platelets related? Oh, I know they all like are came from the hematopoietic stem cell. Oh yeah, but that's not the entire thing. Look at the endothelial cells. You know them? Oh yeah, I've heard of them. They have vipal palati bodies. It's like a glue. It synthesizes P-selectin and von Willebrand factor. It's the glue. Glue for what? Glue for the neutrophils and platelets respectively. Think about it. What's the function of the platelet? The function of the plate is to adhere to the stinking endothelium to prevent blood loss. Cool, so we need adhesion. We need glue. Yes. How about the neutrophils? What's the function? The function of the neutrophils is to adhere to the stinking endothelium so that they can marginate and migrate until they go to the interstitial space and beat the living crap out of the bacteria. So we need adhesion. Oh, yeah. And that's why both of them need vipal palati bodies from the endothelium. In case of platelets, the endothelium will secrete von Willebrand factor to adhere with the GP1B on the surface of the platelet. But in case of the neutrophil, we will have the glue as P-selectin, which will adhere with the Sialolui bodies on the surface of the neutrophil. Adhesion, adhesion, and that's why they are the same. Before adhesion, both of them were rolling and cruising throughout the bloodstream. 
You want to take it to the next level? Okay. Adhesion of the plate to the endothelium and adhesion to the neutrophil to the endothelium was the second step in platelet plaque formation and in acute inflammation respectively. What was the first step? Well, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. If I'm trying to prevent blood loss, the first step better be vasoconstriction to minimize the amount of blood loss. But if I'm trying to let these neutrophils out of the bloodstream and into the interstitial tissue, to beat the living crap out of the bacteria, I need to dilate the vessels to bring in more neutrophils to the outer space. So I better have vasodilation here, but vasoconstriction here. And that's the difference. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. You want to take it to a higher level? Yeah! Acute inflammation and platelet blood formation, both of them are going to suffer in the rare autosomal recessive disease called Shidiak Higashi syndrome because there is a problem with trafficking. Oh, trafficking by the microtubule inside the cell. Oh yeah, so the platelets cannot secrete their granules. Oh yeah, and the neutrophils cannot secrete the neutrophilic granules. You got it. I've told you it makes sense. Okay, metacosis, now I understand. Primary hemostasis, I would like to minimize blood loss. That's why I vasoconstrict. Thank you. Acute inflammation, my job is to increase the amount of neutrophils coming in the bloodstream and leaving the bloodstream to go to the interstitial space to destroy the bacteria. That's why I need vasodilation. You got it, baby. Here is a question for you. Which one is more important, the vasoconstriction in case of primary hemostasis or the vasodilation in case of acute inflammation? Oh yeah, both are important because blood loss and bacterial infection are both bad. That's true. Either one can kill you. However, how fast can it kill you? Blood loss can kill you within minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and you will suffer from a hypovolemic shock and then hypoxia to your brain and then your toast within minutes. But bacteria infection, no matter how strong they are, they cannot kill you in minutes. They need at least some hours. So the vasoconstriction here is way, way more important. It's way more vital. And that's why the vasoconstriction cannot wait for nervous stimulation or for a hormonal stimulation or for synthesis or, or release of some stupid molecules. No, it needs to be fast, automatic, intrinsic myogenic response by the smooth muscles of the freaking artery or arterial or whatever. However, in acute inflammation, we have time to dilate. That's why we can wait for histamine and nitric oxide and they will be released from the mast cells and from the endothelium respectively. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Okay, medicosis, now I get it. I love you because you explained to me that the Ripple Palati bodies are genius because they secrete the P-selectin for the neutrophils and the von Willebrand factors for the platelets. And that's how we economize in a world of scarce resources which have alternative uses. That's genius right there. Yeah, but why are you talking to me about neutrophils in this video? Uh, because I'm trying to tell you about inflammatory bowel disease. It's There's an inflammation there. Oh, okay, so yeah, you can go on. How did the neutrophils know that there is a bacteria infection right here? We need neutrophilic chemotactic agent. Look at the name. What does chemo mean? Chemo means chemical. What does taxi mean? Taxi, transportation, movement, locomotion. So we would like to bring the neutrophils to this location, taxi, by some chemicals. Chemo. Oh, it makes sense. So what are these chemos that will attract the neutrophils to this location that contains the bacteria or the necrosis, the burns, the foreign bodies or the radiation, the trauma, etc. These are 1, 4, 5, 8, 17 and alpha. Interleukin 1, leukotriene B4, C, 5A, interleukin 8, TH17 which will give you interleukin 17 and TNF alpha. These are the chemotactic agents. Very important that you memorize them. Some tips for you. You know this interleukin-1? Yeah, it's inhibited when you give steroids. And that's why steroids, believe it or not, are anti-inflammatory medications. Oh, oh yeah. Leukotriene B4. Oh, but how about leukotriene C4, leukotriene D4, and leukotriene E4? Shut up. These are for bronchoconstriction. They have nothing to do with the neutrophils. So, B4, leukotriene B4 is for the neutrophils. However, C4, D4, 
and e4 they are not for the neutrophils they are for the bronchoconstriction and that's why we give you xylutin or xavier locast to destroy the action of the c4 d4 and e4 leukotrienes but leukotriene before that's for the neutrophils baby have you ever heard of a class of medications that are tnf alpha inhibitors oh yeah i've heard about them they are immunosuppressants oh why do you think they are immunosuppressants because they suppress the neutrophils they suppress your immunity Oh yeah, and I know that they increase my risk of infections, especially tuberculosis. Oh yeah, because if you do not have neutrophils or you do not have your army, you will not be able to fight bacterial infections. Think, people, think. And here are some inflammatory mediators in just one slide. C3A, C4A, C5A, anaphylaxis. This is part of the complement. And of course, anaphylaxis is type 1 hypersensitivity. Bradykinin is for pain. C3B is for opsonization to make the bacteria tasty so that we can engulf them and eat them and beat the living crap out of them interleukin 3 bone marrow stem cell differentiation interleukin 10 and tgf beta they are anti-inflammatory and this is the first step in tissue regeneration and repair if you want to regenerate the tissue you better bloody stop the inflammation first and then you can build when it's clean it's like before you take a shower you better get rid of your old dirty smelly underwear then you can start regeneration and repair Leukotrienes, how about B4? This is for the neutrophils. C4, D4, and E4 for bronchoconstriction. These are the neutrophil chemotactic agents. Now I understand medicosis. These neutrophils are trying to escape from the blood vessel and go to the interstitial space to fight the bacteria. We get it and we attract them through that neutrophil chemotactic agents. Very good. How do they know to the adhere to the endothelium and then leave the endothelium? We need receptors. And we need ligands. The ligand is on the neutrophil, the receptor is on the freaking endothelium. And they attach and kiss each other like a key in a lock, like a truck in a dock. If the ligand is Sialolui, E-selectin will meet it. If the ligand is Sialolui, P-selectin can also meet it. This is step number one, step number two. If we are talking about the intestine and the intestine only, not any other blood vessel, we need blood vessels in the intestine because now we have problem in the intestine, hashtag inflammatory bowel disease. We need alpha 4 beta 7 integrin, also known as LPAM1. What does LPAM stands for? It stands for lymphocyte Pyers patch adhesion molecule one. Oh, why do you say lymphocyte and not a neutrophils? Because inflammatory bowel disease is a chronic inflammation, not acute. For acute inflammation, you need neutrophils. For chronic inflammations, you need lymphocytes, but it's the same flipping concept. Whether you are a neutrophil or a lymphocyte, you need to meet the security guard before he can let you in. So what the flip does that have to do with vedulizumab? Oh, wait. Vedulizumab is a monoclonal antibody against the alpha-4 beta-7 integrin or LPAM1. Oh, therefore the lymphocyte will not be able to adhere to the endothelium. Therefore, lymphocyte will not be able to leave the blood vessel and go to the interstitial space in my bowel causing inflammatory bowel disease. Bango, you got it, baby. What are the side effects of this medication? Oh, it's immunosuppressant. Yeah, therefore there is increased risk of inflammation. Infection. Oh, especially tuberculosis, which is the same thing with all of the immunosuppressants. Remember infliximab, adalimumab, etanercept? Yeah, there was increased risk of infection, especially tuberculosis. You better do the scan tuberculin test before prescribing this medication, doofus. Other side effects. Since this is pharmacology and we're talking about the gut, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. How about a drug-drug interaction? Do not give two MABs together, like do not give two immunosuppressants together. Do not give vedulizumab and adalimumab to the same patient or I'll smack your gluteal region, metaphorically speaking. But why on earth did we call it vedulizumab? Hey, big boy, listen. Paravertebral. Okay, let's break that down. Where is the prefix? The para, which means parallel, beside. Beside what? What's the root? What's the stem of the word? Vertebra. Oh, yeah, beside my vertebral column. Okay, and al for the adjective. This is called the suffix. Same thing here with the drug. We need a prefix, we need a root or a stem, and we need a suffix. But we do not have one stem here. We have two stems. That why That's why we call them substems. So, we have a target substem stems and a source substem. What's the target substem? It's denoting the target of the freaking medication. Oh, I get it. How about the source substem? It's denoting the source of the freaking medication. Oh, so explain to me. LI is the target. LI, when you see LI in a drug that ends in MAP, it means this drug has something to do with the immune system. Case in point, 
adalimumab, adalimumab, it has to do with the immune system. That is cool. How about the source substem? ZU means humanized. This is a humanized monoclonal antibody. The source is a humanized source. We have three types of monoclonal antibodies in pharmacology. Human, humanized, and chimeric. So I get why we call it Li because it affects the immune system, Zu because it's humanized, and Ma because it's a monoclonal antibody. Now I get it. What the flip is Vito? Vito is the interchangeable part. Let's say that you started a pharmaceutical company and you discovered a drug and called it Vidolizumab because it will target the immune system, it's humanized, and it's a monoclonal antibody. I started another pharmaceutical company to compete with you and discovered a similar drug that's also a monoclonal antibody, happens to be humanized and is targeting the immune system. Now I cannot call it Fidulizumab because this is your name, this is your trademark. I will call it something else such as Mikilizumab. Pharmacology is doozy. Oh, pharmacology is so hard and it doesn't make any sense. Oh, shut up. It's just that your professor is woke and cannot explain it properly. Pharmacology is the best. There is nothing that will connect physiology with pathology and microbiology together with internal medicine and toxicology together, but pharmacology, it's the best. A doctor that does not know pharmacology is a plumber, which is what we call a surgeon. Nomenclature of monoclonal antibodies because pharmacology makes so much sense. Okay, big boy, listen, if you say OS in a drug that ends in MAB, it means it's targeting the bone. Remember the OCS or the OCM? Yeah, it means bone in Latin or Greek or whatever. So, denusumab. MAB, it's a monoclonal antibody. It has a U, so it's human, not humanized. Humanized will be ZU. This is just the U. And then we have OS for the OCS. So, it's targeting the bone. Okay, how about if it has KI or K? It will target the interleukin, such as canakinumab. So I have no idea what this is, but I know it's a monoclonal antibody. I know it's human, and I know it's targeting an interleukin. How about when it has an LI? It's targeting the immune system, such as adalimumab, or today's topic, vidulizumab. Okay, this was the target. How about the source? Oh, if it has an XI, it's chimeric, such as rituximab. It's a monoclonal antibody that happens to be chimeric against CD. 20 in the B lymphocyte. Okay, but how about if the drug has ZU? It means it's humanized, such as bevacizumab, or such as today's topic, vidulizumab. How about if it has just a U? It means it's human, such as gulimumab. So even though I have never heard about this drug before, I know it's a monoclonal antibody that happens to be human and it has something to do with the immune system. So let's consult Dr. Google very quickly. Gulimumab is a human, oh yeah, monoclonal antibody, I get it, which is used as an immunosuppressive drug. Touchdown, baby, that's how you do it. See what happens when you master your craft? Some words of wisdom from the great Naval. The means of learning are abundant. It's the desire to learn that is scarce. Oh, baby. You can still get a 25% discount toward my antibiotics course. Use the promo code antibiotics25 at medicosisperfectionalist.com. Thank you for supporting my work. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to get my antibiotics course. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalist, where medicine makes perfect sense.